Is that something you grew up knowing you were going to focus on? Or was there a moment in your life where you decided, okay, I'm taking this direction in sure. terms of my career? Sure. It's a, uh, so that's a difficult one. Um, I think, especially growing up, so uh, maybe taking a step back. So it was only around maybe the 17, 18 year old mark where I thought becoming an attorney is a good idea because it fits my personality. Um, what an attorney is, is very difficult to figure out when you're at that age. Uh, yes. There isn't proper exposure in the schools as to what careers actually entail. So the greatest exposure that you get is what a lawyer looks like on TV. Right, and what they do suits. on TV. Well, there was no suits back then. in a yeah. suit. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in a suit. <laughs> so once I became a lawyer and suits came out, then then it got exciting. Sure. Um, but I think at that age, you understand from what you watch on TV. And it wasn't that glamorous, to be honest. Like the TV lawyers back in the day were like the law and order guys. Judge uh, Judy and them. Yeah, I think that was even afterwards. That was already when I was studying. So like your law and orders was all about criminal law and going to court. Um, so yes, there was the litigation aspect. I think there was actually that assumption that that's what lawyers do. They go to court. It's only when you start actually getting into the profession that you realize there's many different types of lawyers that specialize in many different things. Uh, going to court actually just being one of the small little components of practicing as uh, practicing law mm -hmm. and then when you then i mean i don't know or did you do articles you did yeah. articles obviously absolutely and then at what point did you start your law firm had you worked a couple how, how long had you worked yeah. so 2007 i started my articles i was still studying so i studied through unisa so like i mentioned earlier i uh, didn't grow up um, with a lot of money so unisa was a good option because the uh, I mean it's a lot cheaper than the residential universities. It just takes Correct. a lot of discipline to to study. So I worked and studied at the same time. Um, you were working for a law firm at the time. No, no, no. I ran a backpackers. So I started working. You ran a backpackers. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. So I um, interesting story. So where we lived next door was a backpackers, and the one day this polystyrene head came flying over the wall, and we were like. You know, what's this about? And you hear these guys from next door with a cricket bat and this like polystyrene human body that's now missing a head because it's in my it's in my yard. Um, so I went over. Uh, they asked me to come over. I went over and like just sat there. They had a bar there. So we sat. We had a few drinks. We laughed. Um, got a job there you, almost immediately, like, uh, you know, tending to guests <coughs> and tending to the bar in the evening. Um, you know, just to make a bit of extra money. Six months later, they uh, gave me a management role. So I started running the backpackers. Um, so that was pretty cool. So that's property in and of itself. One uh, yeah, the hospitality industry. Yeah, because so one of my to property. Yeah, and one of my businesses now is actually in the hospitality space. So the, the irony doesn't doesn't escape me. Yeah. Um, uh, although it's not a backpack, it's granted. It's a bit more higher end, but it's still it's still accommodations. Well, one is of my it properties. Airbnb or is it a full on hotel? Yeah, so it's a mix. Uh, so we obviously took our Airbnb knowledge. Mm -hmm. And we bought a property. It's in East Rand, right? So it's got eight rooms. It's got uh, one, two, three conference facilities. Uh, the one we turned into a commercial space. That, uh, uh, then there's another office space at the top. So we rent those out commercially. Uh, the eight, uh, the eight rooms, and then the mm -hmm. conference at the bottom. And then we turned the eight rooms into Airbnb in an attempt to take away, you know, having to have a reception and somebody like ringing and obviously the Google ads and things like that. So we market through Airbnb, we give people self-check-in and they come in, they find their room and yeah. Nice, nice. So in terms of handling property-related cases, sure. do you think that's one of the things that have set you apart? The fact that you've also gotten into the property industry or you've done some work in property. Mm. I mean, your first job yeah. was actually property, managing yeah. Yeah. <laughs> property, yeah. and managing people. Sure. So. That, did that come in handy when it comes to you now running your law firm and dealing with property-related cases? So, so interestingly, um, I I got into property through, call it the back end, right? So most property attorneys, and when I say property attorney, like what do you think of? Uh, property practitioner, conveyancer. Conveyancer. It's yes. always conveyancer, right? Yeah. And conveyance, so you need to remember, so conveyances are trained to understand the laws and regulations in order to be able to transfer property from A to B. 
Correct. And yeah. then they take knowledge that they've acquired in the space and apply it to this, right? So, for example, one of the people I look up to that um, trained me, she started in litigation, became a conveyancer. So the way she does conveyancing is very different to a lot of other conveyances because she's, again, got that problem solving. She knows when to attack. She knows how to fight. She knows how to resist attacks, you know, that sort of thing, how to defend. Mm -hmm. So very similar to me, I got into property because all my clients were litigious. Now, having run a business, understanding the client's business models, understanding that litigation isn't always a once-off thing. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's the thing about my relationship with clients is it's not come to me when there's a problem, I'll sort it out and I'll never see you again. The idea is to take the property investor as an example and integrate myself into his business. What are you doing? Are you buying properties on auction? Uh, this is how evictions look like. Factor that into your cost. Don't be scared to do something just because now you need to go to a lawyer. I'm here. What do you need to do? Let's factor into your cost so you know how much it's going to cost, but maybe you're going to get a really good deal. So that, um, so yes, the backpack is obviously influenced because I've got that business know-how, that approach, uh, approach to this. I started in litigation. A lot of my clients were in the property space. So that's sure. commercial. It's about money. It's about contracts. It's about property. Um, and so the litigation was only about that. So I barely touched criminal law. I didn't do any family law. I enjoyed that business litigation and just happen to be property investors uh, the majority of the time. So have you got like a, a notable property litigation case that you've had mm -hmm. and, and how you've handled it and oh, what yeah. the outcome was? Uh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so property litigation, I've got this one matter and I'll never forget this matter. It's always the one where somebody asks me what's the most notable matter and I immediately go through this because it was such an interesting story but a crazy cool story. So the client... He was a um, property investor, speculator, bought thousands of properties. So sure, he knew thousands. It. Yeah, no, it's, it was massive, like absolutely massive. But what was interesting about him is he always approached with the same um, angle that I just told you now, like integrate the lawyer into your business. So he knew, he, he showed up at that sheriff's auction and there was a guy there already fighting and throwing his arms up. And the guy was, he, he knew what he was doing. And immediately the client saw this guy is going to be a problem. And everyone that auction floor knew this guy was going to be a problem. And most people then didn't want to bid, um, knowing that there's going to be things that happen afterwards. My client bought that property, I think it was for about 1.2 million, because this guy was making so much noise. He actually, it was actually his fault, the property undersold because no one wanted to bid on this property. But in any case, 1.2 million, but a client knew that he's gonna sit with problems. So it took about like five years. So this was an eviction case. But this eviction case, I think there was somewhere around 24 applications that had to be instituted. So Jeez. it was our applications, his applications, his previous applications. So somewhere down this five, a five year period, there were around 24 applications that were instituted. We were in court at least once a month on one of these applications. I had a little template that had it numbered and summarized because it started becoming so difficult to repeat it. I just used to attach a document to the papers. Five years, client sold it, six million, six million rand um, after we were done with the job. They sold it for six million. Yeah, six haven't million. bought it for one point two. Yeah. But it's simply because it was undersold because nobody was bidding for it. And the client was smart. He he provisioned. He budgeted. He knew what the outcome was going to be, but he understood it was going to be a long fight. 